During a series of podcasts, the president of ESC, Deputy Andrea Dudley-Owen, speaks to Express about her committee's mandate and the future of education in Guernsey. The second podcast explores the route Guernsey's education system has taken to this point and what happens next. Deputy Dudley-Owen touches on the difficulty of getting her committee's message across, the battle against the false narrative and why it makes more sense for education to be prioritised in the upcoming Capital Projects debate. The road that our education system has gone through, has gone down Mm. over years and years and years, has been very convoluted and complicated. How do you feel like we got to this point as far as what we have at the moment? How did we get here and how important is your education programme getting it through the door? Well, the the facts uh, to remind listeners are that in 2016, the states made a decision in the March to remove selection from the education system in Guernsey, which effectively means that there would be no more grammar school and that there would be no more selected places, scholars to go to the grant-aided colleges. Um, that's that's states-funded scholars. So that was challenged later in the same year because there was a change of government and the same outcome manifested itself. So we entered into a phase of comprehensive education without really understanding or having a clear agreement about what model of education that we would be delivering within that comprehensive system. Do you think the decision was a jump before knowing then? It was the reason that I voted to retain the selective system with the model that we were using was because I wasn't convinced that there was sufficient coalition around what model of education there should be afterwards because for me I think that there was convincing arguments on both sides but unless we had a a strongly agreed model of education to deliver immediately then it was always going to be extremely high risk um, to to let go of a system that had been tried and tested though was far from perfect um, uh, and and I think that we needed to do more work, more groundwork on what the model would be before the system was um, removed. And so we found ourselves then, I guess, in a position to figure out that afterwards, which is what I guess you're picking up and doing now. Yeah, um, there was the Lapelle model, uh, and I was I sat on that committee, and that was a model to rebuild La Marda Cartret. Yeah. Um, and there was uh, then the Falaise model, which was a, a to college um, model um, and then now the model that's been put forward by my committee um, which I suppose in time will become known possibly um, uh, as a Dudley O model but it isn't it's the island model it's, yeah. it's what um, has been accepted by the states is approved by the states and is now um, very much we're moving very much down the road of implementation of that model. The uh, programme is called the Transforming Education Programme and there are a number of component parts to that. The merger of the Lamar de Cartridge School with the what's known as the current grammar school yeah. and that will become Le Varand High School. Um, the digitisation Um, of our system in terms of improving the infrastructure, connectivity, uh, device and hardware upgrades for students and for staff. Um, The education law which we've just published um, and uh, obviously the Les Osway redevelopment, campus uh, redevelopment project as well. Those um, amongst others are component parts of the Transforming Education Programme and the reason for doing all of that is to improve education in Guernsey. It's yeah. that simple. We are now under a mandate to deliver comprehensive education in Guernsey, which we're doing, and we need to be continually improving our offer because times have changed and we're still in the mindset in the island of delivering yeah. education as we were when I was growing up. And we need to change that. We, we, we've we revamped the law, we've yeah. refreshed the law to um, 
meet the needs of today and also future proof it so that yeah. over the next 50 years we're still confident that that law is fit for purpose. Um, the digitization of infrastructure, the speed at which we need it to operate to support systems within the schools so that we are giving our kids the right skills so that when they leave school that they are going to be really valuable contributors to our workforce, our local workforce so that they've got opportunities outside of Guernsey as well, should they so wish, but obviously we'd rather that they stay um, and and uh, um, have their careers in Guernsey or at some stage certainly come back. There's a whole myriad of reasons why we need to put our shoulders to the wheel of continual improvement, and that's exactly what we're doing through this Transforming Education programme. So this kind of feels like the closest we've got to getting this over the line, I suppose, getting a finalised education system that we can be proud of but it also feels like it wouldn't be getting towards that point without there being some kind of contention along the way and of course that's come about with this capital projects um kind of uh, uh, one of many things but the proposal to kind of reshuffle the um, the priority of certain massive mm -hmm. projects in the states of guernsey um how difficult has that been for this to be kind of one of the big conversations on the route towards getting to the finish line, I suppose, because I don't think you ever expected it to be HSC v ESC, did you? No, and I think that that's, that's not the position that islanders want us to be in either. We are one government. We should not be in a position of pitting one project against each other, especially in two vital areas of public service, absolutely vital yeah. to the success of our island is to have a really excellent education system and a really good functioning healthcare system. Those two things, as well as um, law and order, are the, the three pillars of government. Um, so it's, it's really disappointing and it's a real challenge that we found ourselves in this situation and it's against the fiscal backdrop that we find ourselves in. Um, we're considerably further down the road than the states have ever managed to get with any other project in terms of education. Yeah. Um, we have um, a considerable staffing restructure project that goes alongside three 11 to 16 schools yeah. and a separate sixth form. And that is well underway. We're talking about people's livelihoods now. We're talking about how this affects our workforce. And we, we really do need to get certainty and stability within our education system so that the huge amount of work that is going on every single day to ensure that our systems are right, our processes are consistently applied, that the best quality uh, education is delivered to our kids, um, that our kids feel that certainty, that they know who the, the staff member is that's coming in to teach them um, or to help them out and support them. All of those things are really important. And with a constant threat of political um, mind changing, yeah, is really unsettling, not just for the workforce, not just for students, but for the island as a whole, because it does have a knock-on effect on our reputation, well, undoubtedly. Because at the moment, I mean, the public confidence in decision-making in the States following the tax debate is quite, I don't know, up for question, I suppose. So I guess it can be a bit, you're right, disconcerting for both you and the public for to come mm. up to a really big decision like this. Mm. I think it is. And, I mean, th th this is politics. This is how it works when you've got tough decisions to make and, and that was loud and clear coming out of the tax debate where we didn't manage to agree on a way forward and to accept any of the options on the table we knew that tough decisions would be ahead as a result of that but that said we need to keep working together the tripartite of the Health and Social Care Committee, the Education, Sport and Culture Committee, the Policy and Resources Committee need to work together very hard to be constructive about this and to ensure that states members are presented with something that 
they can work with as opposed to splits the states in two or cleaves it in two yeah um, or cleaves the island in two because everybody has different approaches and opinions on which is more important but actually they're both important yeah you're not wrong if you think one is is one no. is important and one is yeah or one is more important than the other i suppose you talk, talk about that kind of tripartite grouping of have you had these conversations i mean you have you met with deputy Breward, mm, president of hsc yes. with with peter Furbrush yep. to discuss what could possibly be going forward absolutely and i'll continue to do so fantastic um I mean, I guess I just want to get it from your... I mean, could the hospital modernisation project technically happen first? Or it's, is it something that really doesn't seem like it's possible from... Under the current plans, the hospital modernisation phase two requires the movement of the Institute of Health from inside the hospital building to a new home. The new home is planned to be at the Les Osway campus, the post-16 campus because the Institute of Health, the Guernsey Training Agency, the College of Further Education now operate as one organisation under the Guernsey Institute. So we have taken that under our mandate as of last term from the Health and Social Care Committee. So we train our healthcare professionals yeah. um, under the education mandate. So not only do physically um, the, the plans require us to take the Institute of Health, um, and to free up space for the hospital for, um, for their, their strategic usage. We also need to train staff as well yeah. uh, for them to be able to resource their, um, their aspirations in, in delivering healthcare provide, um, provision. So it, yeah, it's really important that we work together to achieve the aims, the wider aims of the states. Um, so what happens if this project doesn't, if the decision isn't the right one? For, for you coming up? What happens to the programme, to the project? Does it stall? The Transforming Education programme halts. So the component parts within that yeah. stop. Which isn't good. <laughs> no, because we, as I say, we, we have gone a considerable distance down the road of restructuring for staff. Um, our plans for the Les Osway campus redevelopment for the um, Guernsey Institute, which includes obviously the College of Further Education and um, the Guernsey Training Agency and the Institute of Health for the apprentices and for um, uh, all those students that study f within that environment, as well as the sixth form um, centre that is planned there, that stops and we're, we're left in uh, a holding pattern um, which at this stage because of the progression of the project because yeah. we are so far in is really difficult to imagine what that looks like okay uh, before I, I, I one more question before I move on to another topic entirely um, I, we got a media release today. It's clear that the committee wants to clarify certain parts of the program. Mm. Uh, for example, the costs of uh, Les Osway campus and the priority and the major components of the of the program and what is actually happening. Why is why is that decision being made? Why are you trying to clarify exactly what the program is through that? Because it's really important that the community at large and also states members are actually considering facts as opposed to rhetoric that has materialised out of opposition. And it's, it's no coincidence that people who are opposed to the model, because ideologically they want a different type of education system yeah. in Guernsey, are the ones who are picking up the false narrative and and pushing it out as if it's fact. And that's got to stop because the, the people who have been opposing the model of education, the 11 to 16 um, with a separate sixth form, um, are really doing the island a disservice. It's, it's so wrong to consistently, if you're in a public office um, or if you're in the media, to be pushing out a narrative that is factually incorrect. 
We've got to be able to trust our media. We've got to be able to trust our um, politicians um, to give us facts. And so when I hear people um, diminishing the huge work that has been done, but diminishing the Les Osway campus redevelopment and the secondary school partnership work to merely picking up a sixth form and moving it 500 metres down the road for you know, a huge amount of money. That is so wrong. So that's uh, the false narrative you're talking that, that about. That is completely the false narrative. And um, I think it's pretty shameful that politicians and media and contributors to the media um, are constantly pushing this out because they disagree ideologically with 11 to 16 um, education with... 16 to 18 to be co-located yeah i mean we're trying to improve education in guernsey it absolutely must be um front and center of every single thing we do to ensure that um the 16 to 18 year olds every single student who is within that sector has equal opportunities to really good high quality facilities and teaching is absolutely imperative to ensure that they've got a broad choice of qualifications at that age and that the different um, denominations of qualification yeah. are accepted equally so that BTEC is held on a par with A-levels. You know, These level three qualifications are really, really important for our young adults and we want to treat them as young adults. So co-locating um, the 16 to 18 cohort on the Les Osway campus opens up so many opportunities for that age group um, and it's just it's a forward-looking way of educating our kids and that's what we need in education we need something new we can't continuously um, look back to um, the good old days <laughs> well but yeah, were they I don't know if they were good old days but uh, look back to methods of education which are fast becoming outdated yeah. um, and Guernsey's success rides on the shoulders of its people, the knowledge, the experience, the skills level of its people because we have no other natural resource. We've got to make sure that the opportunities that we're giving to our young people are the best opportunities. So to constantly um, put barriers in the way of ensuring that education can improve because you may prefer to have another model of education or you think that 11 to 18 education in one school is, is absolutely the only way to go is just totally wrong because the, the, we're letting down our young people by this constant uncertainty. We're letting down our workforce by this constant uncertainty and ultimately we're letting ourselves down. It's a complete own goal and I, and I find it... Um, strange that we're continuously looking to tug at this and um, wanting to unravel it yeah uh, like a like a thread on a jumper you know we, we're constantly pulling at this and it will unravel yeah. if we worry that too much and and we can't have that as i said education is one of our three principal pillars of of running a um, an official uh, um, an island effectively running a jurisdiction effectively, making sure that we have success for tomorrow. So why we would want to consistently um, damage it, I don't know. So part of them is, is this, we'll move on now to the education law, because that's clearly something that's come up recently. Um, your plans to modernise it, update it, to bring this proposal to the States. Um, I was quite surprised to read some of the things that still existed in our 50-year-old education law as it was. Um, why now? Why has why it taken to this point to update it? It's been on the agenda of successive state assemblies and education committees. Um, and really since the early 2000s, possibly before that, um, it had been flagged up that it was starting to get... Um, tired around the edges and not fit for the modern day purpose and yeah. certainly not future proofed. The education law that we're working with at the moment is, is pretty permissive but it's also pretty archaic. I mean when we're, 
we put an emphasis on cleansing children. <laughs> um, I think we, we understand that even that language is, is really not something that we'd be it's using in common parlance these yeah. days. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and delousing and cleansing our kids um, is, is not something that we, we need in our primary law. No. Um, so yeah, we, we needed to update our um, legislation which is what we've done. We've done the policy development behind that. So this is around our primary legislation and um, how we make policy for our secondary and our guidelines, secondary legislation and guidelines, and, and how actually the law ends up working in practice in two years' time once it's enacted. So the process is that we have developed the policy behind it. We then take that to the states. We debate it uh, once approved. That then gets worked up into draft form and uh, we then enact that in two years' time and it needs to be switched on uh, to coincide with a, an academic year in a September. And we're hoping that will be 2025. And so um, part of that is, this, is a new way of governance of schools. Part yes. of that is moving that away from the states and the yep. politics side of things mm -hmm. to the schools. I mean, how does that work? What's the aim of doing it that way? The aim of implementing a governance model for Guernsey within education is to ensure that we are improving our education system. Every single piece of work that we're doing within the Transforming Education Programme, which includes the education law and the proposals within there, are about improving education for our children. So the governance proposals are bespoke for Guernsey, but they are based on universal governance principles and holding our senior leaders within our schools and our settings to account for the actions and decisions that they make, giving them support, giving them constructive challenge, is absolutely imperative to ensuring that we get the best results from our school leaders and that they're making sure that their decisions are all around the children and the, the students within their school settings. So we know it works, we know that the on-the-job training that we've been undertaking yeah. as interim governors has already started to show some positive effects, certainly in terms of how we understand that our education system works. We are able to challenge our head teachers and their colleagues, their senior leader colleagues, about what goes on in their schools looking at statistics, anonymised statistics, of course, um, understanding how different policy areas affect their decisions and how they manifest themselves in practice. Yeah. So, for example, if we are making a policy decision within, within committee, then we can start to understand within the governance setting how that looks in practice. Yeah. Now, obviously, within that, it's slightly clunky because we're undertaking the role of governors with one hat on and then we're also politicians with another yeah. hat on. Now, the job of politicians is to be strategic, is to think high level, is to think about aims and long-term outcomes as well as medium-term outcomes, but it's also to look at larger scale uh, funding and, and budgeting. And that sort of can rub up against the governance. Yeah, okay. You have always um, need them to be roles. independent. And that's what we found is that Certainly the heavy lifting that we've had to do on committee because we have 20 settings, so we have to have 20 meetings every term and we've had to split our committee into two in order to fulfil that, so mm. we can take 10 each. And obviously that takes a lot of preparation in terms of the board packs um, and the uh, we, we try, we're trying to refine the process as we go through so that we are not causing head teachers to do unnecessary work, yeah. we want them to. In, we want to ensure that the information, the reporting that comes in through uh, that that conduit, um, isn't duplicating um, yeah. or, or sort of reinventing the wheel, so to speak. So it, it's really, really um, useful because we start to pick up thematics from those um, uh, meetings. So, for example, IT issues, yeah, or um, human resource issues um, or facilities maintenance issues yeah. and then obviously we can take those as issues arising and talk about those 
as a political committee and what we can do about those at a policy level. Yeah. Le- sorry, pos- policy level. So it's been hugely, hugely informative and we hope that it's been a positive experience for school leaders to understand what accountability really looks like yeah. in being challenged by governors. But in addition to that, I think it has helped to allow school leaders to be able to speak candidly in, yeah. a, um, in a confidential forum to allow them to raise issues and then those issues can be um, resolved quicker than yeah. maybe they would have been before. It's good to know the support is there, I suppose. Yes, yeah. And it is It is equally about challenge. It's about us asking questions that might be slightly thought-provoking or maybe slightly uncomfortable and, and making sure that we're all understanding what's going on but that people themselves are, are, are being challenged. So this is kind of being tested now before in the run-up to this actually happening to see yes. how this works in practice. Yes, and we've been doing it since last July. So we've had... Um, and what was what was prior to that? Three. Nothing. Nothing. No. So there's no oversight of the schools in yes. that kind of way. Yes, but in a different type of way. Right. But okay. if we're talking about was there a formalised governance process? No. Okay. We're the first committee that has implemented a form of formalised governance process over our schools, and. Previously, that has been done in a number of ways which are quite disparate, fulfilled possibly during the inspection times when yeah. schools um, had their inspections and head teachers came quite into a the few committee. Moments, I suppose. Yeah, or through education development support, which is what the education office provides um, still, but actually it's provided in a, a slightly different way historically. Um, I mean, I've gone back through minutes for a decade, which I've got access to for various education committees, and you would see that if parishioners or unders had made complaints about a specific school, about behavioural issues, the head teacher would be brought in to speak to the political committee about behavioural issues. Now, I, I'm a firm believer that we pay professional, qualified senior leaders within our school settings yeah. to do that type of job yeah and we need to ensure that they've got the tools in the box to do that type of job we should not be um interfering in yeah. operational matters as politicians if something goes wrong operationally we've got a complaints process and it's really tight and we make sure we've made sure this term that it's much much tighter and much smoother and much more effective than it's ever been if that operational issue manifests and transpires to be a policy failure that then comes to the political committee yeah, okay. to look at that policy and to see whether it's fit for purpose whether it's a, a legacy issue that actually we're out of date with that we need to try it and test it again um, or whether it's it's just really not working now the the purpose of having governance there is to enable politicians to operate at a system-wide level yeah so that politicians are responsible for the governance of the whole education system not the individual settings within it and that we devolve that to the governing boards and that head teachers and senior leaders are devolved a certain amount of autonomy yeah, okay. to be able to run their schools effectively without politicians getting involved at a day-to-day level yeah. so that we're not telling um, head teachers or senior leaders, what they should be doing at um, this time on a Monday morning. Yeah, okay. Thank you for listening to the Bailiwick Express podcast. The title track was Shift My Weight by Luno. If you enjoyed it, I know it's a pain, but please like and share. It all helps. And remember, you can hit bailiwickexpress.com to stay right up to date with whatever is happening in the Bailiwick. You can find us online, on social, on email, and on internet radio. There'll be more from me, Matthew Leach, and all the Bailiwick Express team next Friday.